Joshua chapter 12. And um, it's a, a, a very unusual chapter in that it doesn't tell us a whole lot uh, of information new. What we're going to see here is a rehashing of what has already been done. Now, what I will say right off the bat is that's something that's important. Sometimes before you can actually go forward, you have to understand what has already transpired. There's been a very um, <clears throat> often quoted statement that if you don't understand your history, you are destined to what? Repeat it. And that's something that is an important thing. Even in our walk with God, when we're trying to understand who God is, what he is to us, how we relate to him, um, how his word can actually be used in our life to encourage, to develop, to strengthen us mentally, emotionally, uh, uh, spiritually. And a lot of times we have to just look back and recognize, how blessed am I? What are some of the things that I have that I didn't think I would have or would, would have been able to achieve? What is it that I, I, I have that maybe I don't recognize how difficult it is, but yet God has blessed me to have that? Uh, and oftentimes, uh, these are things that uh, we just move forward and go on um, and, and don't recognize. M uh, very many times as we go on through here, and we watch what God has told the children of Israel to do. After they have gotten through a difficult time, how many times have we already seen when God would say, go ahead and grab some, some giant stones and, and stack these stones up as a memorial? Today we do that as well. We do that today in a lot of uh, uh, achievements, like sporting achievements, scholastic achievements, with any kind of competitions that we have. We give a person a what? A trophy. They get a trophy. Oh, look! This, this, and we, and sometimes right under the, under the trophy, they put, okay, this is what you did during this period of time. Remember this, because you do have achievements. You do have victories. You have come over a lot of things. You have won quite a few battles, and we can sometimes forget it because we're always focusing on the battle that we're currently fighting, and not recognizing that we've already had many victories. The victories in our past will help and encourage us to realize that we can also have victories in our future. And that's something that we should try to keep in mind. All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get the reading in for our chapter today. Let's take a listen. Uh, Joshua chapter 12. Chapter 12. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side Jordan toward the rising of the sun from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon, and all the plain on the east. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and ruled for Aroer, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from half Gilead, even unto the river Jabok, which is the border of the children of Ammon, and from the plain to the sea of Chinneroth, on the east, and unto the sea of the plain, even the salt sea on the east, the way to Beth Jeshemoth, and from the south under Ashdod Pishka, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Ederai, and reigned in Mount Hermon, and in Salka, and in all Bashan, unto the border of the Geshurites, and the Maakathites, and half Gilead, the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Them did Moses the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite. And Moses the servant of the Lord gave it for a possession unto the Reubenites, and the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. These are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side Jordan on the west, from Baalgad in the valley of Lebanon, even unto the Mount Helach that goeth up to Seir, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession according to their divisions. In the mountains and in the valleys and in the plains and in the springs and in the wilderness and in the south country, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the king of Jericho one, the king of Ai, which is beside Bethel one, the king of Jerusalem one, the king of Hebron one, the king of Jarmuth one, the king of Lachish one, the king of Eglon one, the king of Gezer one, the king of Debir one, the king of Eder one, the king of Hormah one, the king of Arad one, the king of Libna one, the king of Adulam one, 
The king of Makida won. The king of Bethel won. The king of Tapua won. The king of Hefer won. The king of Aphek won. The king of Lasharon won. The king of Medon won. The king of Hazor won. The king of Shimron Miron won. The king of Achsaf won. The king of Teanach won. The king of Megiddo won. The king of Kidesh won. The king of Jokneam of Carmel won. The king of Dor and the coast of Dor won. The king of the nations of Gilgal won. The king of Tirzah won. All the kings, 30 and 1. All right. Now, as you can see, very exciting reading, right? <laughs> you got all of these lists, and you're sitting there, and you're going, wow, this is good sleep medicine right here. I can read this and put myself right to sleep, reading all these names that are very hard to pronounce, all these lands. What does this got to do with anything, and why is this even taking up space in the Bible? I mean, what, what am I going to do with all of this stuff here? Well, if you think about it, there's really good uh, information in here, and it speaks to us too. Now, remember when I was telling you how we, 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 we see some of the victories, and we got a list of all of these, these lands and kings that the children of Israel got victory over, with the help of the Lord. We'll talk about all of that in a minute. But what you do see here is a list. And lists are something that is important in God's uh, uh, word. We see that a lot. We see lists of the, the fruits of the spirit. We see lists of the, of the works of the flesh. We see lists of, of what it is to fight a spiritual battle. When it says the warfare that we fight is not carnal, but 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 spiritual, um, all of these different lists um, that somehow always seem to make it into the Bible. Well, what does that speak of? It speaks of God keeps records. God is aware of the smallest detail. He knows all of these little things that we uh, sometimes just move on past and think, well, no real big deal, let me move on. He keeps a record of it. And when you think about these lists, um, I find it interesting that when it comes to the things of what, what God does in us, we get a lot of information. Remember when we went through um, the inst instructions on how to build the tabernacle, how God to all the different measurements that he gave. And we saw all this information about building this tabernacle. Why? Because the tabernacle was a place that God was building so that men and God can unite. It was a place of bringing God together. So there was a lot of detail to that. Now, juxtapose that to the concept of when God created the universe. How much information did we get? We didn't get a lot of information. It just says, in the beginning, God created the what? The heavens and the earth. We didn't get a whole lot of detail as to what he did with the molecules. He, we didn't get no information on quantum physics. We didn't get any information on, on, on rotational angles and, and, and gravity and, 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 you know, how stars and, and, and uh, burn all of the helium and, and iron and all that to produce light. We didn't get that information. Why? Because it wasn't important to salvation. So when you look at this list, then you say, okay, well, Wayne, I get you. Well, then why is this list, what kind of information does this list tell us about salvation? Well, I'm going to point out a couple of things. Number one, they're going, they're, the Bible speaks about another list. It's called the list of the, uh, of the book of life. It's a book that has a bunch of names in it. And it says, make sure that your name is what? Listed. In the book of life. Now imagine, and I'm going to use my imagination now, and I, and I hope you can join with me, when we're standing in eternity and God is reading names like we're about, like we've just read these names here. And if, if they're going in some kind of order and you can recognize the order that is going, and all of a sudden you recognize, ooh, my name is coming up. You're paying attention now because you want to hear what? Your name. Right? And so it's an important thing to recognize. Yeah, lists are, are wonderful. When they're getting ready to, if, if they would say, hey, we're going to have a, a, a day when everybody, you know, under a certain qualification is going to receive this bonus uh, uh, paycheck or this bonus money or this grant. 
And when they say, oh, the, cri the criteria that they, that they mentioned, I fit in that criteria. And then all of a sudden, they're going to send out a what? A list of names. What are you doing? Yeah. When you get your list, what are you, the first thing you're going to do? You're going through it looking for what? Your name. So you can see how lists are important if it has something to do with what you will be or have or accomplish. So what we see here is a list from two perspectives. We see one list from the perspective of this is what the children of Israel were able to overcome. And we're going to see a, a, from the other perspective, these are lists of people that chose not to follow God. Therefore, they were what? Defeated. And we can get some insight as to why. Why did these people not choose to follow God? And they're listed as being defeated. What you don't want to have is to want to be on a list and do not find your name. See, the Bible says... Uh, if we don't acknowledge the work of God, the, uh, the work of Christ, the scripture says, uh, uh, what do we need to do to have eternal life? And the scripture answers itself by saying, believe on him whom God has sent, speaking about Jesus. So what you don't want to find is that your name is not on the list. The Bible says that uh, there's an opportunity or there is a, uh, a situation where God will do what? Blot your name out of the list, out of the book of life. And somebody said, well, why would God blot your name? That means if he says he's going to blot your name out, does that mean your name was in there? And my answer to you is, I don't know. I haven't seen the books. <laughs> I have not examined them. So I don't know what they are. But once again, I can use my imagination. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. So with that statement, and I'm using my imagination here, uh, I can almost imagine when God uh, loved the world, he put everybody's name in the book of life. And then as you begin to decide, I choose not to follow God and his Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, your name is then what? Blotted out. Now, make no mistake, God is not confused and he's not saying, well, I didn't know this person was going to mess up. He knows already who will make up, who will make it and who will not make it. So, but at the same time, he is so just that he's saying, even though I know what's in your heart, I'm still going to give you the opportunity to live out and show yourself for who you are. And that's what the life that we live is for now. God has no confusion as to whether we're going to make it into eternity. God has no, he doesn't have to run any formulas or, or run and have any questions. Or, I wonder what's going to happen to this individual. He already knows. So our lifespan is for us to know why we will get and why we are on the list that we are on. Why our name is in the book of life or why our name is blotted out of the book of life. That's what that's all about. So then we are not judged without an actual understanding as to what we did. God already knows, but he's not going to judge us without us living through the evidence that we're living through in our life now. So our life is producing the evidence for why we are in eternity with God because we believed on his son, Jesus Christ, or why we are not because we rejected his son. All right. And so those are things to keep in mind. Now, we read through this list. I'm going to skim through it. I'm not going to read all these names again. Uh, but I think it's important that we go through some of this and kind of point out uh, some of the important attributes that we see in this list. And, th and, and, and this, is, this isn't the first list of stuff that we have. And this won't be the last list. <laughs> We're going to see the, book, the, the Bible has quite a bit of lists in it. But let's take a look at this. Joshua 12, look at the first verse. It says, now, these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel uh, smote and possessed their land on the other side of Jordan towards the rising of the sun from the river Anon unto Hermon, 
and all uh, the plain on the east. So what is it speaking about? This is talking about the time when Moses was still leading them before they crossed the Jordan River and got over into the, the land of milk and honey. And so it says, now these are the kings on the other side of Jordan, towards the rising of the sun. The other side of Jordan speaks to the east. The rising of the sun, the sun always rises, what? East to west. So that way you can get a familiarity at the direction. So it was on the east side. And then it gives us the, the list. Sihon, king of the Amorites. All right. Now, you say, okay, well, they got victory over the Amorites. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, Wayne, don't I see the Amorites popping up later on in the Bible? You certainly do. Getting the victory is an important thing. Maintaining is another thing. You see, you can give somebody a really good car. Give it to them. Pay for everything. But if they never put any gas in it, and they never put any oil in it, that car is not going to run for very long. So maintenance, maintaining. So even though you have been gotten, you got the victory of the, the, the price to get the land and have the land be yours was done. But the activity for maintaining and being able to truly utilize it is still an ongoing effort and an ongoing work. This place that they came to, they were coming from uh, out of Egypt into the wilderness and into the land of milk and honey. All of this is great. And even when you get into the land of milk and honey, keep that in mind that it's a good place to be. It's where God promised, but it is not heaven. So there is still work. When you say, well, why do we still have to work? Well, remember what God told Adam. You will maintain your livelihood by what? By the sweat of your brow. So it will always be work to maintain. Even when you're given a gift, you still got to take care of it. So, we're going to see some names here that they got victory of, but they didn't maintain. So we don't want to get laxed and just comfortable when we have a victory and figure I have nothing else to do. We will be fighting and dealing with whatever it is that we uh, struggle with personally all the days of our life until the end of our days. All right. So look what it says. Verse two, a scion, king of the Amorites. Who dwelt in Heshbon. We're going to see that name again. All right. And now I'm going to skip down. Like I said, I'm not going to read all of these names. But uh, uh, you see that uh, it talks about on the half of, G of Gilgad. We're going to see that again. That's in the bottom part of verse 2. Which is the border of the children of, of Ammon. We will see those names again. So what we're seeing is, yeah, they started off good, but they didn't finish well. You ever see, uh, ever watch the, uh, uh, the Olympics or, or any track and field, and when the, uh, the, the race starts, you see you know, one or two people that start off real quick, and they're way, way out in the front, uh, especially on some of these longer uh, races, you know, like you know, your 400s, your 800s. They start off good, but, but if you start with all that you know, going, 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 and you don't build up and maintain a reserve, you will dwindle towards the end. And that's what happens uh, a lot of times when we see some of these tribes that have gotten the victory. A lot of these tribes are going to end up in idolatry. They start well, but they're not going to finish well, unfortunately. And we can say the same thing about people. There are a lot of people that start well. They believe in God, so they say, and they start going through activities. But they don't maintain and they don't finish well. And that's unfortunate. All right, look at verse 3. And it says, From the plain of the Asherion Roth on the east. All right, and then um, it talks in verse 4 about the coast of, of King of, of Og, King of Bashan. Now, we talked about King Og, which is very interesting when they got victory over that. And a lot of times I, I try to, not for every nation, but for a few nations, that, especially those ones that stick out. Some of those kings represent certain things. An example, we do know that the king of, of Egypt, and the, I should say the pharaoh, uh, and the whole land of Egypt is representative of sin. You come out of Egypt, you're coming out of sin. 
Og is another one that every time you see that Og and, and Bashan, uh, even when Jesus was on the cross, we saw that from uh, uh, David's description of the Messiah on the cross in Psalms 22. And it talked about how Jesus was surrounded by many strong bulls of Bashan. And what that speaks to, the king of Og and Bashan, speaks to spiritual entities. So you come out of sin, but you still got to fight against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's what the king of Og is a representative of, uh, uh, representation of. And so, but we see that they got victory over that. Now, I'm going to read the rest of this, and you will see why I said this. Look what it says. Verse 4 again. And the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelled in Ashtaroth and an Edrael. So they had a the the concept of having Rephaim or Nephilim um, genealogy. In other words, that speaks about those that had some spiritual manipulation in their human uh, DNA and their human existence. If you go back to Exodus, not Exodus, we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, it speaks about how that uh, there were giants in the land in those days and after that. And then it gives a description as to how and why. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. All right, so that speaks about a, uh, a un natural um, mingling of false spiritual uh, situations, I should say false, uh, bad spiritual situations with human um, life. And it brings about a corruption of spirituality. So even today, when we have a lot of people that are spiritual, they believe in spiritual things, but they don't believe in God. These are the same kind of mindsets um, that we see here. And, uh, and sometimes you've got to get victory over it. And you say, well, Wayne, what's an example of that? Well, you've got people that believe in things like voodoo, which is a spiritual concept, but it's not of God. You've got people that believe in, in, in working all kinds of, of sorceries and, and, and calling on the dead and, um, and uh, all types of black magic. These things are not natural. This is not... Uh, 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 physics or, or, or chemistry. It's spiritual stuff, but it's not the spiritual stuff that God speaks of. It's not the kind of, so there, there are spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember, that's what the, the Bible says is our true thing that we're fighting against. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we always got to keep that in mind. And so when you see King Og and you see Bashan, that's something that you can always kind of keep in mind about that. But God does give us the victory over those types of things, too. And they got the victory over that land. Okay. And, um, and then in verse 5, and it says, And, and reign in Hermon and in Salkel and in uh, Bashan unto the borders of, of, of Jishu, uh, the, to the Jishu rites. And forgive me for <laughs> mispronouncing all these names. All right, um, and then it talks about uh, them going all the way over against the king uh, of Heshbon, and we'll see Heshbon again uh, as we go through the Bible. But look at verse six. It says, "Them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it for a possession unto Reuben and to the Gadites." to say to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. All right. So remember the, the, that land over there, they saw the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the, and the half of the tribe of Manasseh. These are uh, two and a half of the tribes of the Israelites saw that that land on the east side of the Jordan was good for building and it had a lot of uh, fruit trees and vines and stuff and they were like and they had great grasslands and they said their cattle could do well 
and they decided we don't really want to go to the land of milk and honey. We want to stay right here because what we see right here is good enough for us. So they, they accepted what was good enough for them and did not choose what God had chosen for them. And we're going to see as we continue through the Bible that that's going to be a problem down the road. This is why some of them didn't finish well. Okay? Um, and we'll get to that at a certain point. Right, but when you get to verse 7, it says, And these are the kings of the countries which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side of, of Jordan on the west from uh, Belgard in the valley of, of Lebanon even unto the Mount ha uh, uh, Halak that goes up to uh, Seir which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession according to their division. All right, so here's another list of the inheritance that was received when they got victory over these lands. Okay? Um, and if, we rem if you remember from last week, when we finished, um, it, it ended and it told us uh, in, verse, in, in verse 11, the last verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 11, the last verse, uh, it says, And Joshua took the whole land according to that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions, which we just saw again here, their divisions, by their tribes. And, and then it, it finished by saying, and the land rested from war. That means they had gotten all of it. And once again, you would say, well, Wayne, I know, as I, cause I, I know my Bible. I know there's still going to be a lot of battles and fights and wars going on and that is true because just because they got it that don't mean they they didn't have to do anything to maintain it you still got to do some maintenance you still got to do some things to make sure that you can maintain what you have been occupying all right um, and so um, <clears throat> we see now a list of the uh, the individual uh, lands and the nations that on the west side of Jordan they were able to conquer and so you have an east side and you got a west side, right? And so uh, a lot of times that's like for us too. We got one side of our, uh, of us, of our personality that is kind of like, uh, I just want to take what's, what's on this side and it looks easy. But you got another side that's like, okay, but if we continue on, we will get even more, but we got to trust God for it. But the, the east side is, I like what I see. The west side is I like what God said. And those are two different things. We see this many times. When um, we saw this already with uh, Abraham and Lot. And when they got too big to dwell together, Abraham and Lot agreed, we need to start splitting up because we take up too much land, us together. We have too much. And Abraham told Lot, well, whatever side you choose, I'll choose the other side. And Lot used his eyes. And he saw the, the, the lands of Sodom and Gomorrah, how they were very fruitful and, and, and plenteous and, and lush with greenery. And he chose that side because that's what he could see. Not realizing what he couldn't see was all of the evil that was going on in the land of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. That he could not see. But he chose the beauty over the and then Abraham he just went by faith whatever you don't whatever you don't choose that's where I will go and we see that a lot uh, in scripture and there's many other examples that I can bring out uh, that point that out so uh, yes we do have that we have that walking by what we can see and which would be described as living on the east side and walking by faith which would be what Joshua is doing with the remaining tribes here and they're going to go into this land of milk and honey. All right. And so, as it said, uh, Joshua gave it to them as a possession. In verse 8, it says, In the mountains and in the valleys and in the plains and in the springs and in the wilderness and in the south country. Now, what does that mean? It means there were all types of situations. It wasn't just uniform. Some of it was mountainous. Some of it was a valley. Some of it was plains. Some of it was springs. It was kind of marshy or wet. 
and, and uh, some of it was wilderness. And some of it was the South Country. The South Country speaks about being more towards the South. Usually that's warmer or hotter. All right. So every kind of circumstance and situation on the side of milk and honey. And sometimes we think, well, wasn't this just all wonderful? Keep in mind, and oftentimes people make the mistake, the land of milk and honey is not heaven. It's still a place where you've got to trust God. It's just a place where God says, I have provided victory for you there if you dwell there. If you go there, you will battle, you will fight. But if you fight and if you battle, I will give you victory. But sometimes people get tired. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't, it's, it's too difficult or too hard. Well, it's going to be hard either way. If you trust God, yes, it will be hard. If you don't trust God, it's going to be hard. So choose which hard you want. I'm going to choose the hard with God because I'm going to get some help. That's what I'm going to do. And I also got to tell God, help me to choose that. Because sometimes it's not always simple just to take the, the, the difficult thing. Sometimes we just want to quit. But quitting is choosing not to choose God. I don't want to choose nothing. Well, then that means you just chose not to choose God. So uh, you got to make an effort to just say, I'm going with God. All right. And so, and then it goes on in the second part of the eighth verse, and it starts naming some of these people that we will see again. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Electric Lights. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it just got kind of caught up in that. But you see all these different people, right? And they're going to be around. They're always going to be here. In the land of milk and honey, yeah. You mean, once I give my life to God, I'm still going to have problems with, with health, with finance, with family, with, with uh, weather. With, you're going to always have the high vice, the Jebusites, <laughs> the Hittites, the Canaanites. They're always going to be around. But God says, I will give you victory over it. He didn't say you're not going to de- have to deal with it, but you will get victory. All right? So, but you got to be willing to fight. All right. And then it starts listing some of the other uh, kings that we will that we that we already saw. Look at verse nine. The king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, which is beside uh, Bethel, one. And what, what does that one mean? That means that was one that we got a victory over. And sometimes it's important to keep in mind. How do you uh, get victory over the entire land? One victory at a time. You see that? And that's something that we got to remember. <laughs> Deal with the problem in front of you. Sometimes we want to fix all the problems at once. I'm guilty of that myself. I'm trying to fix everything. I want to fix this, fix that, fix this and fix that. You know, And then it's like, okay, now you get a little overwhelmed. Right? And then you begin to, to wonder, okay, well, how am I going to do all of this? But why don't you do the one that's in front of you right now? Take care of that one. Then go to the next one. And that's what the Lord did for the children of Israel. He allowed them to go through one at a time. And, and look how God lists this in the word of God. He, he, you got victory over Jericho, one. You got victory over Ai, one. You got victory, oh, it says in verse 10, uh, it says, the king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. And you see this whole list, and I'm not going to read through all of this, but you'll see all of this list, that they got victory over. And then right beside the name, you see what? The number that you had to fight, which was that one at that time. And what God is doing is showing you how he will be with you for each one of the various difficulties that you will have to face. And you say, well, well Wayne, is this what's going to happen our entire life? Is this all we're going to be dealing with? Yeah, until you get to the last victim, that last enemy. The Bible has told us already who the last enemy is. And who does it say that last enemy is? Death. The Bible says the last enemy is death. So when you get to that point, he, and he told us that I have given you the victory. He says, I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So, he says, we don't mourn as the world do when death comes. We have anticipation. Nobody celebrates death. Why? Because death is still a what? An enemy. 
but we know we have victory. So we, we rejoice not in death, we rejoice in the victory. And that's an important distinction that we should try to always have. I'm not glad to hear of anybody dying. But what I do want to have hope and trust in is that they got victory over death. That when they hit the, uh, the horizon of death, that the Spirit of God or Jesus himself or however it works, was there to comfort them and welcome them into the land of eternal life. All right, And so that's what we have to keep in mind. Now you say, well, Wayne, can you prove that to me? It's by faith. I haven't been there. I didn't go to the land of spiritual uh, uh, beyond and come back. Although there are some people in scripture that we will see that has done that. We saw that already. Uh, but what we do know is that the Lord told us that I would never leave you nor forsake you, even to the end of the world. So even when you get to the end of your world, he says, I won't leave you. I will be there with you. Now, how that works, I don't know. You got to go by faith and trust that even at that point, God still will give you the victory. Yes, our last enemy is death, but we won't lose to death if we're walking in the word of God and following uh, the, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we are doing that, then even death doesn't get victory over us. All right? And so it went and it lists all these kings. And then um, let's go down to verse um, 30. I'm sorry, verse 23. It says, the king of Dor and the, and the coast of Dor won. The king of the nation of Gilgal, won. 24, it says the king of Atizah, won. All the kings, 30 and 1. Now, it listed them all as what? One. But it also uh, told us that all together there was what? 31. So you look back on there and you go, wow, I got a, I got a victory for almost every day in the month. Most a lot of months have what thirty one days in it, and it's like you 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 look at that and I see little things like that and I try to see how that kind of uh, uh, has a metaphorical or a type, and and it's not so much that, he, that yeah okay well each day you're gonna get a victory like that that's not what I'm saying but it it does show us a a concept if you take one day at a time you got through this right now I'm gonna finish that day. And before you know it, I finished that month. What's today? Today is the very first day of what? October. So we just, we finished September. We just finished it just a couple of hours ago, several hours ago. And now we're starting a brand new month. And guess what? This month will have its own challenges. We're going to have our own things that we're going to have to get victory over. Today, tomorrow, this week, next week. And then, you know, 31 days from now, we'll be in November. I mean, and and uh, then we got another opportunity to just allow God's presence and power to work in our life. And I think these are important. Uh, and this is why I did not want to just say, okay, this is just a book, of, a chapter of lists. Let's just look at the list and move on. I could have combined this with a couple of other chapters and it would have been, you know, we could have got through a little quicker. But I think it's necessary to, since it's in the Bible, it takes up the same amount of space as the scripture that tells us about Jesus being our Savior takes up in the Bible. And I think that if God puts it here, it's for us to try to understand. Now, by no means do I feel that I have exhausted all that you can pull out of this. I think there is still more stuff in here. I think God could speak to you. You could read through this again you know, late, later on in the day, you know, at, just before you eat dinner or before you go to bed. Read this chapter again, and you'll get something else out of it. Because the word of God is like that. It is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the other point that I wanted to make sure that we make here, and, and I'm about to finish up, is that there is nothing in the word of God that is unuseful. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a benefit. No matter how boring it may seem on the surface, it still has some deep truth that if you think about it and you pray about it and you ask God to give you the insight, you will get a message or you will get 
a truth for yourself that will help you take the next day, help you get the next victory, help you get the next battle, help you capture the next one. And, and it's important to do that because we need it. I personally know I need it. I need it all the time for God to assist and to help me to gain victory over whatever it is that I got to deal with the next and keep my joy up by rejoicing over the victories I've already gotten. And so we got to sometimes look back and go and have the joy so it doesn't have you full of fear about the, vic the, the battle you're about to fight. Because the battle you're about to fight, you don't, well, I don't know how I'm going to win this. Well, look back at the ones you already won. Look at your monuments. Look at your trophies that, that God has, has uh, developed for you. Look at your stacks of rocks that God told you to stack up. And, you, and we talked about that when it said that. I said, stack them up in your mind. Go back to your, your victories. And just reha rehash that and think about that. And recognize, God, you got me over this, and you got, and that was bigger than the thing I'm about to deal with now. So if you got me through that, which was even bigger of a problem than what I'm dealing with currently, I gotta have the faith and the belief that you're gonna help me get through this one too, even though I don't know the answer today. But that's why there's always a, another day, you know, tomorrow, right? And so uh, we gotta keep going. So the 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 thing we want to pull from this is. God knows what you're going through. He's keeping a record. There is a list of what you are accomplishing and what you struggle with. Um, there's a list of your victories. There's also a list of your failures. But what God does with our failures, especially our sins, eventually, as we continue to get victory, he takes our sins and our failures and casts them into the sea of forgetfulness. So God never holds us accountable because we take on not our own righteousness, but we take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. That's something that, unfortunately, human beings can't do. We can't forget and just say, I'm never going to look at this person and remember any of their bad habits or traits again. We do that all the time. We hold on. And you know who else does that? And is the king of that? Satan. The Bible says that Satan remembers faults. He brings them to the attention of, of God. He talks and tells He's the biggest tattletale in the whole creation of the world. There's nobody that's a bigger tattletale than Satan. But God is not listening to the list that Satan brings. God has his own list. And we just got to make sure that we're on his list. And the most important list to be on is in the book of life. You make sure that your name is listed in the book of life. And if that's where you are, you are good for time and eternity. All right. We're going to stop here. This was a uh, 